hello everyone, welcome. My name is Bonnie Jacob, and I'm the RIT director of the Rochester Bridges to the Doctorate program. The Bridges grant supports this World of Wonder and Science seminar. Under the NIH NIGMS goal of promoting and increasing the number of deaf scientists. For today's WOW seminar, I'm thrilled to introduce Dr. Abraham Glasser. I believe this is your sign name, is that right? Yes, correct. Okay, thank you. Abraham has his PhD in the field of computing and information sciences from RIT. And he successfully passed his final dissertation defense on November, just this last year, November 7th of 2022, right? Right. And he is one of the first deaf students to earn their PhDs at RIT. And I heard a rumor that Abraham was actually the very first deaf student to defend their PhD at RIT. Is that right? Yes, I am not the first deaf student to start their PhD at RIT, but I am the first deaf student to get to the final dissertation defense. That's great. Excellent. Um, it's an honor to have Abraham with us today. His research investigates technologies for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, um, including both speech and sign language technologies. And he is currently a researcher at the Center for Accessibility and Inclusion Research. Abraham already has a very impressive CV, especially for someone at this earlier uh, stage of his career. He previously completed internships at Microsoft and also at the NASA Kennedy Space Center. And he has also done research at the MTID Center on Access Technology and through several different NSF research experience for undergraduate programs, REUs, both as an undergraduate student and then also as a graduate mentor as well. And he also interned with Microsoft Research in 2020 and then Google Research in 2022. Abraham has received several awards, so I'll just mention three of them. He is the recipient of an honorable mention in the 2018 National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship Program, which is an incredible honor, very impressive. He was also the first place winner in the student research competition at the ACM Chai Conference on Human Factors in Computing Systems. And he was awarded Best Poster at the ACM BRST uh, Virtual Reality Software and Technology Symposium. He has several publications as well. So personally, I'll also mention that I met Abraham a while back. I think it was in 2016 that we first met. Right. And at that time, you were still an undergraduate student and you took discrete math, I think. Mm hmm. I think so. Um, in my class. And he was a great student. It's been wonderful to work with him. And so I actually pulled him in on math research projects to work with me. And we actually have a publication together with two other co-authors um, in the field of mathematics as well. So personally, I have to add that I um, also hope that, you know, Abraham continued in math, but of course, I'm still thrilled that he ended up um, pursuing his interests in computing instead. And I'm very pleased that his career has taken off so well. So now let me stop and turn it over to you, Abraham. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for being here. All right. So the title of my presentation is My Journey as a Deaf Scientist to the Doctorate at RIT. 
Bonnie did already mention several things about my undergraduate and graduate internship experiences, but I will be talking about them again as I explain my timeline of my experiences. My presentation does have two parts. The first part will be talking about my journey, the different experiences I have been involved in as I have gotten to my PhD. And then I also will talk about my dissertation topic in the second half. You might have questions related to the first and or second part of my presentation. Feel free to type your question in the chat and or the Q&A and I will answer your questions at the end. I will just uh, present and then answer at the uh, questions at the end. So my name is Abraham Glasser. This is my sign name again. I started RIT in August of 2015 for my undergrad for computer science. I minored in mathematics. I was involved in four main different activities. As Bonnie did mention, I had REU experiences, summer research experience for undergraduates. I was involved in REU in the summer of 2016 and the 2017, two different times. And those opportunities were key to developing my passion for research. By the time I finished my undergraduate degree, I had been involved in research. I knew how to do or develop research methods and conduct research by that time. I also did some internship experience experiences at different companies. Uh, NASA was the first company I did an internship experience with. It was a very cool experience. I went to Florida where they actually have the rockets that they launch. It was a really inspiring and cool experience. However, at the same time for software development and testing, I realized that wasn't what I would want to do as a career. I enjoyed the work at NASA, but that's not what I wanted to do as a long-term career. So that helped me to realize maybe this was not something I wanted to do. And then in 2018, I did an internship experience at Microsoft. I developed tools for Excel, and those tools are still in Excel. <clears throat> it was very applied work. I developed products for people around the world to use, but I wasn't fully satisfied with that experience either. I did develop a lot of skills and had a good experience, but I realized that I enjoyed the research experience from the REUs even more. I was a research assistant at a few different places during my uh, undergrad degree. <clears throat> I was in the Center for Access Technology, or CAT Lab. I focused on research and development, um, developing and testing with individuals, for example, captions in the classroom. I did help that project launch. And also, I did mathematics-related research with Bonnie. Later in my final year of my undergrad degree work, I realized that I was interested in human computer action, interaction type of work. And so I joined the CARE lab, C-A-I-R lab, and that's where I also did my PhD work under Dr. Matt Unerfauf. I also was a tutor for RIT and NTID as an undergrad. I tutored for math, physics, and computer science for over two years as an undergraduate. I really enjoyed working with other students and helping them to understand different problems they were trying to figure out. And I developed a skill of explaining things and framing concepts in different ways. I really enjoyed that experience also. You can see here that I did gain a lot of experiences as an undergrad. To talk about some 
takeaways from my undergraduate experience. As I was developing this slide, I was looking back and thinking about what I learned during my undergraduate experience. First, clearly, I was involved in several different things at the same time. Maybe one semester I would be off campus and then be back on campus the next semester. I had to learn time management skills and scheduling. I had to learn when or what I could say yes to or needed to say no to. And uh, maybe some nights I would have to work overnight to catch up on things or I would postpone things or be behind. So I learned some of this in my undergraduate. Looks like we've got about 30 people here today. And I do recognize some names here, some students, some professors. Looks like we have a good mixed audience today. So all of you, I think, are pretty experienced with undergraduate life and what that looks like. Second, undergraduate takeaways was learning. I mean, of course, you take many courses to get your bachelor's degree. I took different uh, computer science courses, different math courses, and electives. My elective courses were helpful in increasing my general knowledge, which would be and is helpful for me later in life. During uh, undergraduate studies, you might not have a, a lot of time to invest in one specific topic to learn what you want to about it. And that's what I got to do in my PhD time. But during my undergraduate studies, I did learn how to make different friends. I became involved in different clubs and activities. I really might depend on your level of involvement. You might end up being a president of a club on club on campus, or you might just uh, be involved in different or uh, organizations or clubs. Again, meeting new people and building a network is very important. I mentioned that I had a few different research assistant experiences. I'm still in touch with all of the folks that I did work with. I still keep track of the things that they're working on and what they're doing now and check to see if maybe there's something that I could collaborate with them on. It wasn't just a one semester of work for me and then I never talked to these people again. That's not how I approach it. It's very important to develop those relationships and keep that network that you develop. Exploring interests. I was involved in summer REU opportunities as well as company internship experiences and parts that I liked, parts I didn't like, and that was helpful. Helping me to know what I liked and what I didn't like. And depending on your major, it might require three or four internship or co-op experiences. My major did require those. So that was a good push for me to look for internship and co-op opportunities. For the REUs, I want to explain about the first time that I was involved with an REU. It was actually my first time being exposed to research and research methods. I had learned some technology or techniques, but I didn't really know how to do a research project and then what to do after the research project was completed, um, you know, doing presentations or talking to people about your work. I hadn't thought about that until I did the REU and finished the summer experience and went back to um, my regular studies, but my second REU experience wasn't new. It was my second time. And so I was able that second summer, I was involved in two different projects. One, I had a leading role where I helped other students to uh, learn what they needed to do and make the plans for the project. And then we did have a publication and I did a presentation from that project. 
The second project uh, was more exploring AI and sign language related um, work, but I was new to that project and was more curious about what they were doing. That experience was beneficial because I learned how uh, new approaches are or uh, new concepts are approached and how that work is done when you're starting a new project versus the other project that I was very involved in that did lead to a publication. And I did a presentation about that project for my first conference. And after my presentation, different folks came up to talk to me and ask questions and were interested in collaborating on future research. So that was a really neat experience for me that I enjoyed very much. I think my third year as an undergraduate student, I became involved in a research project that continued beyond just one year. It was a longitudinal study. Later in your career, it is important when you're working on something that will be more long-term, uh, there are different benchmarks or milestones that you'll want to complete so you don't get too far behind in your projects. But as an undergraduate, when I was a research assistant for the CAIR lab, I reach out to participants to help recruit subjects for the research studies. And then as I became a PhD student, I continued that project, but we built on top of it. And I will be explaining a little bit more about that here soon. As you can see, again, I was involved in four major activities. Uh, the first one was REU mentoring, meaning that I was part of an REU, but as a graduate mentor rather than a research assistant student. So I worked with a faculty member to advise and support students and coordinate students doing the research work. I, you know, guided students in terms of what was a good way to do things and how to better improve their research work. And so that continued from my undergraduate REU experiences. I started my PhD program at RAT in August 2019. And I did have more industry experience during my PhD program but they were more research focused positions rather than software development and testing positions like I had had previously. So I got research experience in industry, which I really enjoyed. I was able to learn what industry research is like. In I think 2018, I gave a presentation for an REU symposium. And I met Dr. Matt Hunerfoth there, who's my PhD advisor, but I met him there in 2018 for the first time. He enjoyed my presentation and I told him that I was very interested in pursuing research and I was thinking about a PhD at that time and talked to him about that. He suggested that I email him to follow up and we ended up having a meeting. Um, he interviewed me where I talked about my interests in accessibility for deaf and hard of hearing people using technology and computing and that fit with his interests very well. He also let me know that he was um, starting to work with PhD students and bringing PhD students into his lab. So I applied for the PhD program and was accepted. Um, I applied in 2018 and then I was accepted to start in 2019. I finished my bachelor's degree in December of 2018 at kind of an awkward time. So in January 2019, I was a full-time research assistant in Dr. Hunerfoth's lab. So I was involved with three or four different projects at that time. I had 40 hours a week to work on research, so I was heavily involved in several different projects. And then by the time I started my PhD, I was able to pick one of the projects that I could continue working on a little bit and then branch off into my own idea. And I'll explain more about my own idea and my dissertation work for the second half of this presentation. And that's what I worked on for the rest of my PhD. Something people often say is that it seems like it was fast uh, for me. It doesn't seem like a normal timeline. You know, three years bachelor's and then three years PhD is pretty quick. But I think the key is that I already had that early research experience. 
very early, starting in my first, um, end of my first year, beginning of my second year, I realized that I enjoyed research and that that's what I wanted to continue doing. So by the time I started my PhD program, I was already very comfortable with the research pro process and methods. So I could focus on my own research and creating new ideas at the very beginning of my PhD program. I also had the opportunity to publish uh, quite a few articles and give quite a few presentations. So that gave me the opportunity to be able to finish uh, by the end of 2022. And I'll be walking this May, um, next month in 2023 at May graduation. So in my graduate career, I'll talk about a few takeaways and things that I learned. First, like I said, in undergraduate, it was time management. And that's still true in my graduate program too, but then it's more project management. So for, for example, if I have to complete recruiting all of my participants uh, within two weeks, then I know I need to run the experiments within the next month. And then I know I need to focus on writing papers, doing analysis, analyzing results within the next month after that. So it's that type of timeline and planning in terms of project milestones. Part of it is also people management. So I did have undergraduate research assistants working with me during my PhD. They helped me run experiments, uh, run participants, and that type of work. I did also have the opportunity to start a few projects, not entirely from scratch. I'll explain a little bit more what I mean by that later. But to start with an idea of a project and planning a project, hiring students, running the experiments, and basically seeing the project from the beginning all the way through to the end to publications and presentations. I did have a few publications that were rejected from conferences. Uh, where the reviewers said, for some reason or another, um, they didn't accept my paper. And that was frustrating. It's difficult to deal with rejection like that. And at that point, I also had to decide about whether I would accept their feedback, make revisions, and resubmit, or whether it would be better to just submit to a different conference, or even drop the paper altogether. And in those moments of indecision, I realized how to build a good resilience and how to get through that type of uh, rejection, you know, not to get too thrown off by it, or unexpected failures, uh, just to accept it and keep going and be resilient. So I learned how to work through that type of thing. And then also, of course, the COVID pandemic um, did throw things off a bit too. I had planned to buy equipment, fancy cameras, computers, uh, planning to do in-person experiments for my research project. And then because of COVID, I wasn't able to do in-person experiments. So I had to pivot over to Zoom. And I had to figure out how to shift the experiments fairly quickly. And that's the experiment that I'll be talking about in the second part of this presentation. So again, building resiliency, being able to overcome frustrations. I also had the opportunity to present at several different conferences. I was involved in four or five different projects helping with publication and dissemination and presentation. In 2019, the first year of my PhD program, I was traveling at least every month, sometimes even two times a month, going to different conferences, going to give presentations. And then in 2020 and 2021, I still attended many conferences, but of course they were all from the comfort of my bedroom, from home, online, virtual. And then in 2022, of course, last year, I started going to conferences in person again. And through that, I learned how to practice giving a presentation, how to control my nerves. I also knew how to make sure that my audience would understand me. I became more comfortable interacting with a variety of different people. I've been at conferences as a panelist to talk about my experience as a graduate student with a disability. I've also been involved in diversity workshops. Um, I've worked with accessible technology conferences. Really, I've been involved in conferences in a variety of different ways. And during my PhD, I also started thinking about my career, what I would do after I graduated with my PhD. That took a lot of reflection and self-analysis, thinking about my skills and what type of impact I could make. Also, whether I wanted to work in industry or academia or somewhere else. 
And I'll talk about that more soon, I believe. I had to figure out what I like doing um, and really what I wanted to do at the end of the day. I also gained a lot of experience in different ways. So for example, through mentoring, I had the opportunity to mentor REU undergraduate students to teach them how to do research and to help them run experiments. I also advised a master's student with their master's capstone. Um, they were working on one of my research projects, so I gave them feedback about their capstone project and had some mentoring experience with that too. Like I said, I've been involved in quite a few different conferences and workshops um, as a panelist, giving a presentation, being involved in workshops where we discuss uh, in depth different topics and potential solutions for them. And service. I've also been on the panel to review submissions to conferences several times. So when submissions, um, potential presentations or publications are submitted to a conference, I was a reviewer, meaning that I would review the potential submissions and help on a panel to determine which would be accepted. I've also moderated a session at conferences and that type of thing. So next, right now I'm still considering some positions both in industry and academia. I'm leaning more towards academia. I haven't started yet, but I'm starting to plan out um, the main activities that I plan to do. In academia, the main activities are teaching, advising, research, and service. Teaching, of course, means teaching classes, developing curriculum, Advising means working with master's and PhD students um, for two years for a master's student, for potentially five to seven years for PhD students, giving them advice and support. And then research. And a key component of that, I plan very soon to start applying for grants. A lot of the opportunities that I've been involved in were available to me because of grant funding. So for example, the NSF, the National Science Foundation, has many different types of grants, but it requires an application, basically filling out a proposal explaining what you plan to do for research, what your budget is, um, and the budget includes traveling to conferences, paying students, setting up a lab center. All of that has to be included in a proposal that's submitted uh, to hopefully receive grant, funded, grant funding to be able to actually do the research. So grants are very important in academia, and that's the key to opening up new opportunities. It's all about money, unfortunately. And then I'll also continue building my research portfolio. My research so far has touched on a few different topics. I've been involved in captioning research, um, some VR virtual reality research, some sign language and AI research. And I would like to both expand my research topics and also delve into more depth in each of those different areas. And then of course there's also service. So that means uh, internal curriculum development, search and hiring committees, um, other internal university activities, and then also external activities like reviewing for conferences, being involved in boards of organizations and that type of thing. Now I'll get started on the second part of my presentation. So this complicated diagram is my dissertation structure. It is over 300 pages long, but I just chose one topic to discuss with you all today, one piece, and it's this one. <laughs> okay, I'll get uh, go ahead and get started. So the title of my dissertation is Analyzing Deaf and Hard of Hearing Users' Behavior, Usage, and Interaction with a Personal Assistant Device that Understands Sign Language Input. I did not do this research alone. I had graduate and undergraduate students assisting me in this work. And our lab, C-A-I-R, you can see the logo at the bottom. It is on RIT campus. This research experiment 
was published in the CHI Conference Proceedings of 2021. I decided to, to sum my presentation a bit for today. The motivation for this is personal assistant devices, Alexa or Siri or Google, et cetera. You can see some pictures here of examples. And uh, these are used for asking lights to be turned off or what the weather is tomorrow, for example. And they are very inaccessible to deaf and hard of hearing individuals because they don't have the ability to understand sign language input. And if they respond in voice, as they typically do, then the deaf or hard of hearing user cannot get that input. Some now have screens, which make them more accessible to deaf and hard of hearing users. Some do have captions enabled, but still it's only a one-way communication. The deaf or hard of hearing user cannot um, give any commands to the personal assistant device. Seventy-two percent of respondents have used a digital assistant, 45% own one. Some even have them in their vehicles so that they can give voice commands. Technology can be really great, but not when it's not accessible to deaf and hard of hearing individuals. That's an issue that we are focusing on. Before I did this project, there was previous related work, some conducted by me. I did ask deaf and hard of hearing community members if they would use this technology if it could understand sign language or they could use sign language with it. Many of the respondents said yes, that would be very cool, but they don't use them really because they don't yet have that ability. Now the interaction has different phases. It's activated typically by saying something like, hey Google, or hey Alexa, and that will wake up the personal assistant device and be ready for the next commands. Or you could then give the command or ask your question, and then the personal assistant device will respond to you or to the user. So there are three phases. The first phase, I worked with master's students to find out how they would want to wake up a personal assistant device, whether it be to touch the device, to do a gesture or a sign of some sort, or push a, a button somehow. I also did some interviews and collected various commands that people would think about using with these devices. Then I asked how they would want the device to respond through a picture, through sign language, through something on the screen, or how they would prefer to receive information back. And then I wanted to give them a hypothetical experience but we haven't done that quite yet. Um, so that is one of the things that we wanted to do through this experiment. My experiment is called Wizard of Oz. It is a way to make it seem like the device worked and understood the sign language, but it doesn't really. So because of COVID-19, we used Zoom and everyone was in their own homes. The participant would open Zoom and they would see Alexa on screen and they would see the deaf research moderator. They don't see that there's an actual interpreter behind the scenes with their video off. So the deaf person signed, for example, to Alexa, the question, hey, what's the weather today in Rochester? So then the interpreter would voice to Alexa, 
the question. And then Alexa would show it's 80 degrees and sunny. And the deaf person was surprised that Alexa understood their signs, which wasn't the case. There was an actual interpreter there, and that's why we call it a Wizard of Oz. So we had 1,400 utterances by 21 respondents that we then analyzed. Our first research question was how users instinctively wake up the device. I had done an experiment previously asking some questions, but then we wanted to see if there was anything new this go round, and there were some new responses. So these are screenshots from the video. One person said, hello, like, hello, what's the weather? <laughs> the second picture is a hey, getting attention, getting a uh, sign. Then another one is uh, waving, sort of. And then you have curious. And then the sign for do, what are you doing? And then finger spelling of Alexa. Future developers or designers of this type of technology, um, could use this information to help them with the development. Our second question was, what categories of commands or requests do users produce and what do they look like in ASL? There were many different responses to this question. Some were related to time, like uh, set a timer for five minutes. One was related to food. For example, find me the best pizza restaurant nearby. Another was um, shopping related. For example, I want to get a new iPhone and where can I go to do that? To summarize what's on this slide, we did find some unique things that we didn't originally expect. Some users or participants had unusual word order for example, what is the weather tomorrow? Some would say instead, weather tomorrow, and that's all. Some would add a question mark and then, so do they would do a question mark, pizza where, or pizza restaurant where. Also, the use of sign space, even though folks were on Zoom, they might would point to something off screen. They would point even though the person on screen wouldn't be able to see what they were pointing to. And we analyzed how people said yes, no, play, pause, pointed, and other different control commands we did make note of. I won't go in depth for this presentation today. Question three was how do users recover or respond when there is an error or a breakdown? What happens in that situation? If they ask the personal assistant device and get no response, do they ask again or what do they do? If you look at the table on the bottom right, you see ignored. That's where the participants would just move on if they didn't get a response. Next is repeated. Some would ask again, ask the question again, repeat it. Some reworded. If they would ask a question, they would think maybe the personal assistant device didn't understand, so they would reword it or rephrase it. Some played along. And if the response was off point of what they uh, had asked, they would just go along with it. And some asked a question in return, like, what was that response or what are you doing? So some would respond with another question. So from this study, what we contributed and uh, some takeaways from this experiment. This was the first study that allowed deaf and hard of hearing individuals to interact with a personal assistant devices.
a, a device. Uh, no script, no instructions. They just got to play around with the personal assistant device and interact with it. We did record the sessions and save them and then uh, anno make annotations. And we share that data widely for other researchers or developers. They can download the experiment and uh, the questions. Those are the two main contributions from this study. The paper has more suggestions, recommendations, and guidelines for how future groups could work on this research or continue this research project. And this whole thing, all of this was one research project and only one or two chapters in my dissertation. So there's a lot more, but I decided to just show you a little bit here. So I think I will stop at this point and we'll open it for questions now. I'm curious about the experiment that you described. And I wonder if there were any people who figured out that there was an interpreter behind the scenes or, I mean, maybe you didn't really study that, but did you, do you have any insight or thoughts on that? Yes. Um, most people didn't realize or notice maybe, well, maybe they did at the end. In Zoom, the interpreter changed their video name to software or ASL recognition or something like that. We did tell the participant that we would be using the camera to watch and capture their signs and all of that, but yeah. I'm wondering about when you planned the experiment, at that time, did you know that you would need to use Zoom or did you have to quickly change um, the project that you had already planned out? I already did the prior work before COVID. So I had done some interviews, sent the survey out nationwide and started collecting that data and opin opinions about hypothetical situations where deaf and hard of hearing users could interact with the devices. But then when I started to set up the experiment, COVID happened and so I then shipped the device to the interpreter to have at their home and then shipped things to the researchers and set up the cameras, made sure that that we all tested our cameras and our systems to be working properly before we got started. And then last year, late last year, we did start in-person experiments. The same idea as Zoom, uh, but in person, because things are getting back to in person, uh, but we use the same script and we are learning different th things from the Zoom sessions and different things in the in person sessions. Interesting. Oh, it looks like there's a question that came up in the chat also from Andre. It says, great presentation. What do you recommend or recommendations do you have for deaf and hard of hearing people who might be interested in a PhD program? <laughs> That's a good question. I think this is more general and not specifically for deaf and hard of hearing folks, but look at different PhD programs. Look at the professors who work there and who hire PhD students. Look at their publication history and see if it might be a good match for you. Having a good advisor is key to doing your PhD. For hard of hearing and deaf individuals specifically, let's see, my advisor has been at RIT since 2013 and he knows sign language and can communicate in ASL. He does bring in an interpreter, 
but I feel like I can be more transparent with my advisor and, and talk to him more directly. So if you can find someone who knows about the deaf community, that would be great. In general, it might be hard to find. So it would be good for you to be able to advocate for yourself, be able to explain what you need and wor what works best for you. And then I see a question from Lisa about whether I'm currently pursuing an NSF grant and what for. So at the moment, I have not yet started um, a faculty position, but I'm planning for it. And I have an idea for the type of research topic that I would like to do. But I also want to create workshops for deaf and hard of hearing students in computing or for deaf and hard of hearing students in research more generally, uh, similar to an REU or a workshop with invited deaf and hard of hearing role models uh, who have successful careers, who can come and support you know, upcoming um, researchers and students. When I was an undergraduate, that was really helpful for me. So I would like to give that opportunity to the next generation of students and scientists. I know uh, Bonnie also does an REU at RIT um, and is also involved in the URISE program and the Rochester Bridges to the Doctorate program. So those are other examples of programs that help students transition into higher graduate education and help students you know, stay motivated and inspired. So I would like to be involved with those programs too. Well, I very much enjoyed your presentation. Abraham, thank you for presenting for us today. So everyone, a round of applause for Abraham. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to the audience for coming and listen to my presentation today. I hope that I'll be able to be at RIT to give in-person presentations again soon. Yes, definitely. And congratulations. <laughs> congratulations. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.